Today, in part two of our series, Women of the Old Testament, we learn from the story of Ruth and Naomi. How do we overcome obstacles to holiness? What lessons can we learn to deal with life's problems? Can anything stop God's plans for redemption? How do faith and hope work together to release us from bondage? How does God's plan overcome all obstacles? Here's Pastor Seth. God, when I think about the book of Ruth and Naomi, just a casual reading tells me something of the uh, easy plot line. Let me see if I have this. Boy meets girl. Wealthy boy meets poverty-stricken girl. They get married. Sort of live happily ever after in spite of all of her many disadvantages. Oh, yes, and then there's a grandma who goes through uh, all kinds of shattered dreams. But at the end of her life, she holds a little grandson in her lap. And she's as happy as a lark. And you made all that happen. Uh, is that the story you're telling? Uh, Seth, you may think that's the story I'm telling. That's certainly the story Hollywood would tell out of this book of Ruth, but that's not the story I'm telling at all. There's a deeper story uh, that I'm telling both that, that's an inner story in both the reshaping of Ruth and the reshaping of Naomi and a clear picture of what I'm trying to do in you as you look at the third character, Boaz, to where these three people value me more than they value the things which you just said. A good life, a comfortable life. Well, I kind of want a Cinderella story here where everybody lives happily ever after. Is that, um, is that not what you're doing? Well, Seth, when I think about happily ever after, the first word that comes to my mind is heaven. And everybody who's, who gets there is going to live happily ever, ever after. But it's going to be because largely what I do in the people's inner stories, including your own, uh, of reshaping you to where you do value me and the things of God and you value my son as your greatest treasure more than anyone else and more than anything else. And Seth, that takes a lot of difficulties, many more than you think. Okay, well that pre presents a paradox to me because if you want people to value you more than anyone else or anything else and that involves a lot of trials that we're not going to like, it appears to me that when people go through a lot of trials, the thing that they do is they say, well, well where was God and why isn't he doing more to help me? And instead of being drawn closer to you, it seems like some of them use that as an excuse to walk farther away from you. You're only looking at about half of the story. Because at some point, my hope is that people will exhaust all of the things they think will make life work and fill their heart, and they'll finally come to a place that they would not come to without difficulty of seeing that only I can meet their deepest need, that joy, ultimate joy, and lasting joy is found in me, and that they place the central hope of their life not in life going well or not in their comforts, but in me. Okay. Well, let's go to our, uh, let's go to our, uh, uh, Seth, no matter what happens in your life, I can reach into your heart with the power to form you into someone who values me above everyone and everything else. I am determined to reverse your values. Uh, well, let's look at uh, three obstacles in our three characters uh, in, our, in our story. Uh, there are three great obstacles that uh, are in the way here. And uh, the story of Ruth, uh, I kind of divide into a four-act play. Uh, act one is in O Little Town of Bethlehem. But this is not O Little Town of Bethlehem when, where Jesus was born. This is going back about 1,100 years before that. Ruth 1, verse 1. And what we're going to look at first is the character of Ruth, and she had overwhelming disadvantages. Overwhelming disadvantages. 
In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, which means in Hebrew, my God is king. His wife's name, Naomi, which means pleasant, and his two sons were Malon, which is Hebrew for sick, and Kilion, which is Hebrew for pining, which tells you a little bit about um, their mother, which we'll see as we get into this story. Now, the first verse uh, sort of hints at uh, a broader setting here. It starts out with, uh, in the days when the judges ruled. This is before there were kings, King Saul, King David, all those guys. Back before then, uh, the people uh, just, just lived, and there was this loose organization of government, but they, they kept going away from God, farther and farther away from God, and their culture just sort of spiraled down, 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 until it got so bad that uh, it just sort of caved in, and they were usually invaded by a foreign land. And it wasn't until they hit rock bottom that the people called out to God, not in repentance, but for relief, for help. They should have done the former, they mostly just did the latter, and God sent a judge or a deliverer to come and lead the people to overthrow the people that had invaded, the army had invaded, and to bring them back to a time of blessing. But instead of the people turning in their hearts to God because of blessing, they just sort of like, isn't life grand, and went back into the same moral slide. This happens all through the book of Judges. When Ruth says that, when the first verse says there was a famine in the land, my suspicion is that this goes back to uh, one of God's determined ways to try to capture the attention of the people and to wake them up out of their spiritual stupor is to provide a famine where there is hardly any food. We don't usually think of God at work in that way, do we? But he is. And this is how our story begins. Now, there's a little, little family here, a man by the name of Elimelech. His wife's name is Naomi, and they have two sons. That's act one. They've got to pack up and leave Bethlehem. They have to sell their land, sell their property, off to somewhere else, uh, which brings us to act two. They go to Moab, which is east uh, of uh, the east of uh, Bethlehem, across the Jordan River into pagan Moab. Uh, the people would have been... Uh, uh, mortified to have to do that, but they go. When they get to Moab, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies. She becomes a single mom, raising two sons. We don't know how old the two sons are. The scripture just said she was left with her two sons. They, they grow up to a place where, verse 4, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah, not Oprah. <laughs> Orpah which means stubbornness, like to, uh, glad I don't know that woman, uh, and the other, Ruth, which will be our character we're looking at here, her name means friendship. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Kilian, the two sons, and now two husbands, also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So you have the picture here? They left home, Bethlehem, all their culture, all their friends, all their relatives. They had to sell their land, sell their house. They go to a foreign land, foreign culture, foreign language. Um, and uh, Naomi buries her husband, and she buries her two sons. There are left Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, both of whom are Moabite women. And here she is in a foreign land. Uh, as Naomi thinks about this, she, sa she says... Um, I think I'm going to go back to my uh, homeland. And the two Moabite women, the young daughters-in-law, come to her and they say, we want to go back with you. Now, one of them is easily sort of persuaded to stay, but Ruth is not. Uh, and you wonder, why is Ruth willing to leave her country, leave her language, her culture, to go back with Naomi, her mother-in-law, back to uh, Judah? What's going on there? What has she discovered? Uh, verse 16, we hear something of Ruth, and this is one of those things you, you, know, you hear in about half of the weddings that um, 
that are performed. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not a, a direct application of a wedding, but uh, you hear Ruth talking to her mother-in-law. She says, don't urge me, which she'd been doing, to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. And we just sang a little song that has to do also with that same idea in it. Your people will be my people. And then notice what she says next. She says, your God, my God. Now, just asked a minute ago, why would she leave her family, her extended family, her culture, her language, her history there to go across the Jordan River to live in a land she's never been to with just her mother-in-law? And what's sort of indicated here is that she has discovered something in Naomi's God that is making a difference in her life. There's something different going on here that she sees with, with Naomi that's been birthed in her, and she wants to continue. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And here the idea is you hear something of a confidence that she has in the goodness of God that even though we've been through a lot of uh, heartaches together, uh, I know that God is telling a redemptive story, and I am confident in that story. Something has happened in spite of overwhelming disadvantages that, that Ruth currently has. She's a widow. Uh, she has no property, no land, no job, no job prospects, and no children. But there's something going on inside of her that's alive, that's life-giving. Uh, she knows something of the redemptive story of God. The question that I think of when I, when I think about this part of the story is, are natural disadvantages more important to you to overcome than an unholy value system? What bothers me more? When I face disadvantages and struggles, does that bother me more? Or does it bother me more that I'm more committed to those things than I am to, to being God's person and being committed to him? That's the first obstacle, overwhelming disadvantages. On the inside of your handout, we meet the, the second character, uh, and this is Naomi. And the, uh, this obstacle is shattered dreams. And this one, to me, is even more poignant uh, than Ruth, shattered dreams. Think back about Naomi's story. She grows up in Judah. She marries the, the man of her dreams. She has two sons. What does she dream about? She dreams about having a home and having land and probably farming, uh, watching those boys grow up and get married and having children, having grandchildren someday. Uh, and instead of that, uh, a famine hits the land. They have to sell their home. They have to sell their land, probably all the furniture that they had, all their possessions. They have to flee to a, a land they don't want to go to, a culture, a language, all of that. And when she gets there, her husband dies. The two boys marry. After they've been there about 10 years, then both the boys die. She's done three funeral services. Now she's in a foreign land, foreign country, foreign language, foreign culture. Her shattered dreams are right in front of her. Verse 11, Naomi said, to the two girls, and this is before what we read from Ruth. Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then could give birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. And then notice what's happened to Naomi. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Now, the question to ask is, is that what's happened? Now, Naomi's not really sure about that, but at least she can say, as far as I can tell, things are terrible. Uh, this is a picture of shattered dreams. This is the language of shattered dreams. Um, uh, the one girl stays in Moab. Ruth goes with her. 
The scene shifts to Act 3, scene 1. Naomi walks back across the Jordan River from Moab and goes back to Bethlehem, and she returns to, from Moab to Bethlehem, and she returns, and all of her friends who had been there years before when she'd grown up and had married and had two sons, they greet her. And this is the return. Verse 20. They greet her, Naomi, which means pleasant in Hebrew again. She she says, call me Mara, which is the Hebrew word for bitter. If you remember when the people of Israel were uh, in the wilderness wanderings, they drank some water that was called, or that was bitter, and they called that place Mara. Same word. Uh, Call me Mara, call me bitter. That's my new name. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full. The Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Pleasant. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Now, when I think about the story here so far, I think about um, what words would describe her at this, at this place in her life. And I think about the word misery. It's, it's, my life is just miserable, be one. I think disillusioned would be a second word that strikes me here. I never thought it would play out like this. And then confusion, I don't know what to make of what God is doing in my life at all. I have no idea. It seems to me like somehow the hand of God is against me. This is, this, this is the sounds and the feelings and the thoughts of shattered dreams. But there is, as we'll see in the story, a small faint trickle of faith that there is a redemptive story and hope. It's very faint, but it's still there. You say, well, Seth, how do we know it's there? Because she doesn't give up on the redemptive story. Even though her dreams have been shattered, she still keeps moving forward. Now, the third person that we meet here is Boaz. He's the wealthy, older man. Uh, He may have been uh, um, Elimelech's brother. We're not really sure who he was. But uh, of the three obstacles that that have to overcome, this is the third one, material resources. He's got too many. Now, of the three obstacles to overcome, you'd probably prefer this one to overcome. You know, don't sign me up for shattered dreams. I don't want to overcome that obstacle. Uh, don't over for, for overwhelming disadvantages, but sign me up for material resources too much. <laughs> this is Boaz. Act 3, scene 2. Naomi returns to Bethlehem. Ruth is with her. They have nothing. Verse, chapter 2, verse 3. So she went out and began to glean in the fields. This is Ruth. Began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. And then the story starts to make its redemptive turn to human eyes here. And look how the writer says this. As it turned out, as it turned out, she found herself working. You hear a hint in both those two phrases there? Uh, This is not just coincidence being at work, but there's a story being played out here, a redemptive story. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Meaning, the land and the house that had been sold when they had to leave many, many years ago is still within the extended family. And what do you know? It belongs to someone in the extended family, which means, what do you know? We might be able to buy this back. What do you know? Now, um, Boaz meets her. He's sort of taken with her uh, in a healthy way. Uh, the scriptures say that he protects her. He goes to her and says, um, be sure you stay kind of with the crowd. You don't want to kind of get off by yourself. Uh, I can't guarantee your safety uh, with some of the scoundrels who work the fields. Um, he makes sure that she has enough to eat and enough to take home to Naomi. Uh, you see something of the, of the goodness of his heart. Uh, not just, uh, what about my resources and my money and my wealth and those kind of things. Uh, you see, something of uh, the resources that he has don't serve himself primarily. They serve to be 
a source of generosity and to build relationships. That's something different. Uh, with Boaz, I see three things. A wealth that did not numb his heart. He still had a soft heart for people and for people who were in trouble. A desire for love that made money a second thing. He was not going to sell his heart for money. And then third, integrity, as we will see as the story unfolds here, that refused immoral, which we'll see uh, shortly, and illegal activity, both of which he could have done, uh, towards satisfaction of that desire or towards his desire. In other words, this guy is a man of integrity. A picture here of what God is trying to form in us. Uh, when when uh, Ruth goes back home, at the, at the end of the day of gleaning, she tells Naomi about this, and Naomi is thunderstruck. She is dumbfounded because for the first time, She's able to see that God really is at work still in her life, even through shattered dreams. Here's her response. The Lord bless him. Speaking of Boaz, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, and then notice what she says next. The Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Now, who's the dead here? The dead is her husband, her deceased husband, who owned the land, and she can see there's an opportunity for his name to continue through the land as, uh, and through his heirs, which was important in that culture. Uh, so, showing his kindness to the living, that's her, and that's Ruth. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen's redeemers, meaning this is a fellow that could buy the land and could buy the home. And, um, and could end up marrying you, Ruth, and, uh, and set the family name of Elimelech and Naomi back down into the extended family here in Bethlehem as it's supposed to be. Now, something happens here at this point, I think, inside of Naomi's heart. She sees that there's a plan going on, uh, God's plan, that's very different from her plan. Uh, her dreams have been shattered, but not the dreams of God for her have not been shattered. And then maybe her life has gotten to a place where it seems miserable to her, but God is still very much at work telling his story in her and through her. And that happens here, and will continue in the story. Now, as she thinks about this, um, she tells uh, Ruth uh, these instructions, and um, you know, I, I want to I think this is, a, you know, a Jewish mother telling, you know, just being a Jewish mom. But really, I think this is almost any mom telling her, uh, her uh, daughter and, uh, daughter-in-law uh, who's uh, lost her husband. Uh, she says, wash and perfume yourself. Put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, which is where all the workers spend the night. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When, he, when he, he's had dinner and everybody goes to sleep, when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, I learned a new phrase this last week. Never heard this phrase. Just two words. Proposal ready. Proposal ready. We're not done, huh? <laughs> Dang, I was almost in the clear. <laughs> um, Naomi can see what could happen here. And she's sort of scheming to try to make that happen. And we go to Act 3, Scene 3, which is the threshing floor that night. Uh, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This is after he wakes up and realizes that uh, she's pulled back the, the blanket from his feet and realizes in the darkness that it's her and that she's there that's done this. This is his response. I bless you. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men. Apparently, he's maybe 20 years her senior. Uh, whether rich or poor. 
Um, what he realizes is, uh, in, in our language here, it'd be something like this. Um, when he realizes that she has pulled a blanket back from his feet, it's sort of like uh, she's saying, if you propose, I'll accept something along that line, which is what he realizes. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Meaning, though I would like to propose to you, I'm really not, in Hebrew law, the next one in line to do that. There's somebody ahead of me to do that. And though I would like to buy the property and the land, and again, and for us to live together, um, there is someone who's, who's ahead of me in that. And the right thing to do is to go to him and let the, the thing of integrity to do is to, to go to him first and give him the right of first refusal and to be integrous there on the threshing floor night and not do what he probably, in one sense, wanted to do. All it is, although it is true, he says, I am near of kin. There is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning if he wants to redeem, good. I mean, he's going to go talk to the fellow. He's going to tell the fellow the situation. Let him redeem. If he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. He doesn't take advantage of her, and he, and he doesn't take advantage of a land grab that he probably would have tried to have made if he was not a man of integrity. She goes home the next morning to tell Naomi what happened. Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Now, this is just a side note on this. That last sentence that Naomi said is, is a sentence that uh, both haunts me and I aspire to live up to. And sometimes it seems like I'm so far from that. Look at, look at what she says, what, what she sees as manhood. The man will not rest until the matter is settled Oh, maybe later on this week, maybe later on this month, maybe this summer, maybe next year. This is a man on the move with what's important. Just, just, just a little side note there. Well, the scene shifts, Act 4, Scene 1, the city gate, where uh, Boaz shows up, and Boaz goes to the, uh, the elders of the town, and the uh, kinsman redeemer who's ahead of him is there, and he tells the kinsman redeemer in front of the ten witnesses that, um, that uh, the land is here and that, there's, uh, that Ruth is here and Naomi and that the, the land um, uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be bought again. And, and this kinsman redeemer says, yeah, I'll do that. I'll buy that land. And then Boaz says, but there's a package deal. If you buy the land in the home, you also take Ruth uh, as your wife. And he says, you know, I can't do that. He says, so I'm going to pass on being the kinsman redeemer. Now, the next one in line is Boaz, and Boaz strikes the deal there in front of the 10 elders of the city. Um, they, uh, they make the agreement in front of the witnesses. Uh, he buys the land back for Elimelech and for the family, and he goes off, verse 13, Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. Interesting the things that the the Spirit of God thinks to throw in there. Um, the uh, the storyline is continuing, is the idea, from God's point of view, as we'll see in just a moment. She gave birth to a son. Naomi has a chance to see, after many years of shattered dreams, she begins to see different dreams forming, a different plan, a different life than the one she had seen. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. They're all dumbstruck too. May he become famous throughout Israel. Now, this is a blessing that they just throw on this little baby. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. She has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. Now, this is a grandson, but Naomi has a son. It would mean a son in their culture. The, 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 the generations continue. They named him Obed. 
He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, Naomi would have no way from a human point of view of knowing that the little grandson in her lap is going to be the grandfather of King David. And she probably has no idea that through this lineage, the Messiah is going to come through the line of David, through the little grandson that's sitting in her lap. No way of knowing that. She has some idea that there's a, there's a redemptive story, but how much of that she knows? Maybe a very small part. But I can tell you this. For the last over 3,000 years, now she knows. And the idea that she got to be a part of this, even through her shattered dreams, is probably still jaw-dropping to her. There's something of an unsmotherable hope. I don't know if that's the word or not, but I liked it. <laughs> unsmotherable. Unsmotherable. <laughs> unsmotherable hope. That no matter how badly her dreams were shattered, uh, the unsmotherable hope that gives way to a small amount of faith out of which joy grows. That's very different from the kind of joy she imagined when she was just a little girl. Well, as we close, I think about Boaz. What kind of man was Boaz before he met Ruth? Ruthless. I'm going to tell Craig, we, have, we may, may have a lot of edits out of today's message. <laughs> All right, on the back of your handout, there are a few lessons that strike me from, from our story. <clears throat> holiness, and only holiness, brings lasting joy. Being devo- holiness means to be separated to God for his purposes. Unholiness means to be separated from God so I can live out my purposes. And what you see in this story is God will go to any length and any sacrifice to change something in us from this unholiness to holiness. And it's out of that holiness, being devoted to him, living for his purposes, out of which joy has a chance to arise. Second, no problem in your life, whether difficult problems or agreeable problems, can stop God's redemptive plan. You really see this in the story of Naomi. I, I mean, I certainly do. Third, faith and hope together release love. These two things, faith and hope together release love. This is what I think of when I think of Ruth, who stands there, and her mother-in-law tells her to go back home, and she says, no, no, I'm going with you. Because she has tasted something of, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And just that enough was enough for her to say goodbye to a lot of good things. A lot of natural advantages, as we like to say. Uh, And number four, no matter how dark the world around you, no matter how difficult the world inside of you, God's plan overcomes all obstacles to holiness. Overwhelming disadvantages. Anybody relate to that? Shattered dreams? Material resources? Probably few of us in this room that I know of on that one. And I think one of the, one of the questions that I think about as I think about this and reflect on my own life, I say, you know, God, it seems to me like I'm still more concerned when things go bad than the possibility of me going bad. And that's not good. I can see that you're still wanting to do something of what you did in Naomi and in Ruth in my life. And then when I think about, uh, I think about Boaz, I can almost hear God saying to me, did you see Boaz in the story? Does he remind you of anyone? A man who was wealthy, who gave up uh, quite a bit, in order to become your kinsman redeemer who came a long way for you 
and who paid a great price as your Savior and Redeemer. You're going to like my son when he comes. Let's pray together. Alex, as we pray, why don't you come on up? Father, we, um, we do pray that you would give us eyes to see um, in these simple four chapters of this amazing book what you're doing in the lives of people, what you're doing in our lives, the transformation you're using, uh, of which you are involved with, and bringing about day by day, even when life seems to have tremendous disadvantages to overcome, and even when there are dreams that have shattered we may never know if they'll uh, reappear or not. But you are doing something in us that we need more than advantages and more than we need dreams to come through. You are making us a different people that value you above everyone else and everything else and are hooked on, clinging, that you are telling a redemptive story through the course of our lives, no matter what that story involves, whether blessing or heartache. And that one day, like Naomi and like Ruth, we will look back on our lives and the disadvantages with which we had and the, and the shattered dreams that we had. And we will kneel down before you in humility. Every mouth will stop. Every complaint, every whining, every griping, every complaining will look foolish as we look back and see what, what the amazing, redemptive God did in our lives. We uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.